At the first media press conference of the 2023 African Development Bank Spring Meeting in Egypt, President of the African Development Bank, Dr. Akimi Adishino, told the rise that the bank is pushing ahead with climate-focused financing for Africa in spite of global headwinds. He stressed the importance of AFDB's African Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation. A rise business correspondent wrote to the in Egypt and sent in this report. The 2023 African Development Bank Spring Meetings kicked off in Shamashek, Egypt, a resort town located between the desert of the Sinai Peninsula and the Red Sea, and the host of COP27. Day one featured registration and identity verification for media and participants and for their financial convenience, banking on wheels, an actual banking on the go, fully mobile financial services structure in the form of a vehicle, complete with a hall and ATMs, courtesy of the National Bank of Egypt and Banke MISR. President of the AFDB, Dr. Akimu Mia Dishino, set the stage at a press conference with the media on the theme for this year's spring meetings, which is on climate change and how it will be financed. Welcome to the 2023 annual meetings of the African Development Bank Group. And I know several of you are here in this same place, in Chalme Sheikh, for the COP27, which was so well hosted by the government of the Arab Republic of Egypt and was such a good, great success. And here we are again, this time at the annual meetings of the African Development Bank Group. We are basically following up from where COP27 left right here, with the theme of our annual meetings this year being mobilizing private sector financing for climate and green growth in Africa. We caught up with the president and asked him if he's worried about global economic headwinds and what the AFDB is doing to reach its climate funding goals amid fears of a global recession. Well, first and foremost is that the uh, global economy, of course, uh, is facing quite some challenges right now as uh, developed economies are trying to have contractionary monetary policy. And as they are having that in the U.S. and also in the Europe, what is happening is that it's actually raising interest rates. And as it raises interest rate, it means the cost of borrowing has gone up. Many of the African countries that have actually uh, have a lot of obligations in euro bonds, issuance that they've had, they are seeing the cost of their service uh, costs of their loans actually uh, uh, going up significantly. You've also seen significant increase in the yield curves themselves. And so therefore the premium, the risk premium for new insurances are actually going up, which is not in, uh, 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 good for, uh, uh, for, for African uh, uh, countries. And so we are trying to use the equity we have in that concessional window of the bank, which is for those countries, the low income countries, we have equity about $25 billion. We think that if we take that equity and we go to the capital markets, we rate that as a triple rated financial institution, we probably can raise, you know, close to about $30 billion or, 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 or thereabouts for these countries that desperately need it. And we'll be able to raise that money for them uh, so that they can have concessional financing, log out tenor for it, and have transformative projects. So all I'm trying to say is that we're doing our best, but we are working together with the IMF and everybody else coordinating. It's a, it's a very tough environment globally, uh, but I think that, you know, uh, we, we released our African Economic Outlook report this year, uh, which shows that you know, five of the six African countries that used to be in the least of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world are back on it. So which means that African economies are growing, they're resilient, you know, uh, in, in the face of everything, you know, um, I, 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 as we always say in Nigeria, you can't put me down. The AFDB also used day one to unveil and dive into its African Pharmaceutical and Technology Foundation initiative an ambitious mission to increase technology, transactions, build research and development ecosystems and achieve regional health security for the African continent. There has been a tremendous effort on the regulatory framework uh, for vaccines and for medicines. Uh, registration is something extremely important and we've been able uh, to work uh, with the uh, international uh, uh, patents to be able to create uh, a very fast uh, environment for registration, so that is uh, one key element. To have now the debate on health is very important and it's important to come up with ideas on technology and transfer of technology and production of medicine, that's why we are here now. And that's why I was very happy in November when we met with the president and then his team, where we could see how we could leverage some of the know-how that we have now to take Africa to a different level. 
we now understand as Africans that we could do things and then move the continent in a direction that wasn't done before. So made it initiated, you will find. Speaking to Arise News, Dr. Akiyomi Adishino also shared his thoughts on the importance of the AFDB's African Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation. What the African Technology uh, Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation will do is first and foremost help African indigenous pharmaceutical companies to access proprietary technologies globally. So we would, it will try to intermediate. The second, it will build the know-how and technology know-how of the African companies. Three, it will also support the regulatory environment so that when they produce the, uh, the medicines, they are actually safe and quality uh, 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 medicines. And finally, whether it's in the US, whether it's in Asia, whether it's in Europe or Latin America, or in India, uh, or, or, or Bangladesh, when you see massive amount of pharmaceutical drugs being produced, it's because they have very solid research and development ecosystem. So this African Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation will support the development of the pharmaceutical uh, research and development ecosystem and link it to the private sector so that we can make quality drugs that, that, that meets the epidemiological profile of, of, uh, of Africa. So climate change and the necessary funding to close the technology gap and provide the necessary research and development to improve pharmaceutical output on the African continent. Two very, very important topics dealt with on day one of the African Development Bank spring meetings in Shamashek, Egypt. Rodo Sadiri, Arise News. All right, uh, so from Rodo Sadiri report, we now join the live coverage of the 2023 annual meetings of the African Development Bank group currently holding in Shamashek in Egypt. Africa must invest in hydrogen, wind power, solar energy, and hydropower. The African Development Bank Group is keeping time. The Alliance for Green Infrastructure has been established to close the infrastructure financing gap. It was actually filled with water. We just need to find a way to extract it. Africa must invest in hydrogen, wind power, solar energy, and hydropower. The African Development Bank Group is keeping time. The Alliance for Green Infrastructure has been established to close the infrastructure financing gap, build sustainable and resilient infrastructure for Africa, to invest in quality green infrastructure. The bank's projects such as the Noor Wazazat, the Lake Turkana Wind Power, or the Abu Rawash Wastewater Treatment Plant are transforming the face of our world. The continent is ready. Let's mobilize private sector financing for climate and green growth in Africa. Welcome to the 2023 African Development Bank Group's annual meetings in Sharm El Sheikh. We will reflect on how to generate a sustainable and inclusive future for a wealthy, self-reliant and resilient Africa. How can Africa invest smarter, aim for a lower carbon footprint, and develop fresh off-grid energy solutions? How can the continent convert its natural capital into industrial capital, financial capital, agricultural capital, and knowledge capital? Time is unstoppable, but we can alter March to its beat. We can speed up our commitment, step up and make bold actions to mobilize private capital to finance Africa's climate action. The clock is ticking on Africa's future. Every minute matters. Every action is critical. Thank you for the video, and um, the video does show what challenges stand before the continent. And indeed, the annual meetings here in Sharm El Sheikh is an opportunity to engage and find solutions to the issues that have been raised. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, 
please join me in welcoming the president of the African Development Bank Group, Dr. Akimomi, a additional to deliver his keynote speech. Mr. President. President of the Arab Republic of Egypt. His Excellency, Mr. Azali Asumani, President of the Union of Comoros and the Chairperson of the African Union. Your Excellency, Emerson Dambuzo Nangagwa, President of the Republic of Zimbabwe. His Excellency, Philip Isto Mpango, the Vice President of the United Republic of Tanzania, representing Her Excellency Samir Suluhu Hassan, President of the United States. Emerson Dambuzo Nangagwa, President of the Republic of Zimbabwe. His Excellency Philip Isto Mpango, the Vice President of the United Republic of Tanzania, representing Her Excellency Samir Suluhu Hassan, President of the United Republic of Tanzania. The Right Honorable Edward Ingerente, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Rwanda, representing His Excellency Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda. His Excellency Gavis Indiraku Buka, Prime Minister of the Republic of Burundi, representing His Excellency Evariste Indayishimye, President of the Republic of Burundi. His Excellency Hamse Abdi Bari, the Prime Minister of the Federal Republic of Somalia, representing His Excellency Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud, the President of the Federal Republic of Somalia. His Excellency, my dear brother, Musafaki Mohammed, the chairperson of the African Union Commission. His Excellency Mustafa Badbuli, Buli, the Prime Minister of the Arab Republic of Egypt. Honorable Hazan Abdallah, acting governor of the Central Bank of the Arab Republic of Egypt, and of course, the chairperson of the Board of Governors of the African Development Bank. And, and by the way, just as the Secretary General has said, he and his team and those in foreign affairs, all the ministries, they've done a fantastic job. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gov Governor. Your Excellency Staff Major General Khaled Fuda, the Governor of the South Senior Governorate, Honorable Governors of the African Development Bank Group, His Excellency Dr. Sultan Ahmed Al Jaba, the Minister of Industry and Advanced Technology of the United Arab Emirates and UAE Special Envoy for Climate Change and COP28 President-designate, alternative governors of the African Development Bank Group, senior officials of the Arab Republic of Egypt, Mr. Omar Kabaj, former president of the African Development Bank Group, heads of regional economic communities and financial institutions, members of the Diplomatic Corps, executive directors of the African Development Bank Group, my own senior management and staff of the bank, media houses, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2023 annual meetings of the African Development Bank Group with the theme, Mobilizing Private Sector Financing for Climate and Green Growth in Africa. I wish to start by thanking His Excellency President of Sisi, my very dear big brother and also friend, for hosting so generously the 2023 annual meetings of the African Development Bank Group. I applaud and I am grateful, Your Excellency, for the excellent support of the government of Egypt in preparing for these annual meetings. Thank you very much, sir. A special welcome to you, the heads of state and government, for being here for these annual meetings. Thank you for honoring our invitation. Your presence in such large numbers is a testament 
of the great friendship you have, of course, with Egypt and the support that you have always been given to the African Development Bank. A special welcome to President Asali Asumani of the Union of Comoros and the chairperson of the African Union, chairman of the African Union, and President Emasi Manangagwa of the Republic of Zimbabwe. We are delighted as well to be joined by Vice President Philippe Pago of the United Republic of Tanzania, Prime Minister Hamze Barry of the Federal Republic of Somalia, Prime Minister Edward Ingerente of the Republic of Rwanda, Prime Minister Gaves Indira Kubuka of the Republic of Burundi, and my dear big brother, His Excellency, former President Joachim Chisano, the former President of the Republic of Mozambique. A special welcome to you, my dear brother, Your Excellency Mustafaki, the Chairperson of the African Union Commission. Thank you for your strong partnership with the African Development Bank and for your support. Thank you very much for all we do together. I'd like to give a warm welcome to all our governors of the bank, honorable ministers, and all participants to these annual meetings. We are particularly delighted to have two special guests, His Excellency Omar Kabaj, the former president of the African Development Bank Group, and His Excellency Dr. Sultan Ahmed al Jaba, UAE Special Envoy for Climate and COP28, our president-designate. And just so that you know, I was talking to uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Egypt, my dear brother, and he was telling me he can't wait to turn off uh, this to you for COP28. So uh, let's give it up to the uh, Minister Shukri of the uh, Arab Republic of Egypt. He did a fantastic job globally for us on COP27, and we are going to COP28. Thank you very much, brother. Of course, a very special welcome to my own loving and darling wife, Grace, thanks only for being here. You are my greatest supporter. Welcome to the beautiful city of Sham el Sheikh, a modern city being managed exceptionally well. The governor of South Sinai, Major General Retired Khaled Fuda, and his team are doing an incredible job making Egypt and Africa very proud, and Your Excellency, Mr. President, you should be very proud of them. I came to this place, I saw them, the way they pay attention to detail. To make you proud, it makes us proud. Thank you very much. <laughs> Shal Meshek brings back some great memories for us. It was right here that the world met for COP27, the place where the world again renewed its commitment to keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. It was right here, under the excellent leadership of President El Sisi, that the world made the historic decision on loss and damage on climate change. Loss and damage, yes. African countries, which accounted for only 3% of the cumulative carbon emissions globally, now suffer disproportionately from its negative consequences. Right here in Egypt, water security has become a national issue. At COP27, Egypt launched the nexus on water, food, and energy, a very bold effort to mobilize $14 billion to tackle the effects of climate change. The African Development Bank is leading this effort to mobilize $1.4 billion support Desalinization and water treatment plants for agriculture. Your Excellency, Mr. President, I'm delighted to let you know today that we have actually exceeded that target. With all our partners, we've mobilized $2.2 billion from development partners to advance your mission on this. Across the Sahel, hotter climate is drying up water basins. The Lake Chad Basin, which used to support livelihoods of millions of people in Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and Cameroon, has shrunk to one-tenth of its size. In several parts of the Horn of Africa, rains have not fallen for over four seasons. And in Malawi, Mozambique, Madagascar, Zambia, and Rwanda, 
Cyclones and floods have left devastation in their wake. For the loss of lives and destruction of a lot of infrastructure and for the small island states are buffeted by rising sea levels, coastal erosion, of course, significant losses. Whichever way you look at it, Africa is being devastated by climate change. It loses seven to $15 billion a year due to climate change, which is projected to rise to $50 billion by 2030. Finding the financial resources to tackle climate change is increasingly difficult for African countries that are still reeling from the effects of COVID-19 pandemic, now exacerbated by climate change, debt, and inflation arising from the mixture of global geopolitical conflicts and the high global inflationary trends. Africa's cumulative climate financing needs are estimated at $2.7 trillion between 2020 and 2030. Climate adaptation costs are estimated between $249 to $407 billion over the same period. Yet, climate financing resources are only flowing to Africa in trickles. As the continent receives only a mere 3% of global climate finance, of which 14% is from the private sector, the lowest, I must say, in the world. So there's much to do to leverage private sector into climate finance and green growth. Your bank, the African Development Bank, is playing its part. We have exceeded our commitment to provide 40% of our total financing to climate, reaching 45% in 2022. We committed 63% of our total climate finance to adaptation, exceeding the global target of 50%. And in the bank, the praise from the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres at the United Nations General Assembly as a global leader on climate adaptation. I think we should clap for the African Development Bank. And we'll continue to do more. To do more, we launched the African Adaptation Acceleration Program. Together with the Global Center on Adaptation, to mobilize $25 billion for climate adaptation. Now, while developed countries must meet their commitments to provide $100 billion annually to developing countries for climate finance, this is still, even though a good gesture, minuscule compared to financing needs. Public climate financing must be complemented by mobilization of resources from the private sector. To mobilize more private sector climate financing for Africa, we launched the African Financial Alliance for Climate to bring together all financial institutions, stock exchanges in Africa, to green the financial ecosystem. Financial institutions should incorporate climate financing into all their operations. The valuation of companies on the stock exchanges, based on the greening of their portfolios, will provide greater incentives for green investment across Africa. The use of green bonds can mobilize global green finance into Africa. And that is because Africa currently accounts for just 0.2% of the $2.2 trillion of cumulative green bonds issued up to 2022. The African Development Bank has issued more than $10 billion of green and social bonds in the past 10 years. It has allowed us to support green projects, such as the Cabeoluca wind farm in Cabo Verde, which supplies about 20% of its electricity. And right here in Egypt, the Gabal El Asfar water treatment plant, which supplies water for over 3.3 million people one of the 10 largest water treatment plants in the world. And when I came here to see His Excellency President Assisi, and I mentioned this to him, he said to me, look, we are working on probably about three or four other water treatment plants. 
And it happens to be even bigger than what I've just said today. And I'm quite pleased that right here in Egypt, Mr. President, you take bold decisions and one thing that I admire about you, make them happen very fast and at scale. I think by the time you look at all of what is being done, it's amazing that how fast change can happen. Thank you, sir. We are using the private sector to transfer to the market the climate risks facing countries by insuring countries against climatic shocks. The Africa Disaster Risk Financing Program, which has been implemented in partnership with the African Risk Capacity, now supports African countries in managing risks of climate disasters through risk profiling, contingency planning, and disaster risk financing. Your Excellencies, it is working, and working very well. Three years ago, when Madagascar suffered from droughts, the program disbursed $2.1 billion to support losses suffered by 600,000 vulnerable people. Similarly, when Malawi experienced droughts, the insurance program unlocked $14.2 billion of payout to farmers. The bank is now working to deepen the development or reinsurance markets to expand the capacity of the private sector on market risk transfers. Your Excellencies, we must do more to green the infrastructure space of Africa through private sector financing. And that's why the African Development Bank, Africa 50, and partners launched the Alliance for Green Infrastructure in Africa, which we call AGIA. It will accelerate private sector investments in renewable energy, green urban infrastructure systems, green hydrogen, and climate resilient infrastructure. AGIA hopes to mobilize $500 million of project preparation and project development financing using private equity platforms and to mobilize $10 billion of private sector financing for green infrastructure in Africa. The African Development Bank is also using blended financing to accelerate private investment in electricity. We are implementing with public and private sectors a $20 billion desert to power program to develop 10,000 megawatts of electricity using solar in the Sahel and provide electricity for 250 million people. And when it is done, it's going to be the largest solar zone in the world. And Mr. President, we are particularly also pleased as a bank to have been part of supporting you for the uh, Ben Ban project that you have here, which is also a great solar program. The bank is deploying private partial credit guarantees to support the mobilization of private financing. A good example is our recent provision of 195 million euros as partial credit guarantee to support the Republic of Benin to raise $500 million on global capital markets. And last week, our board of directors approved a $345 million partial credit guarantee to support Egypt to raise $500 million in private financing for green growth through its issuance of its first ever sustainability panda bond, which I must say is also the first in Africa. As the world moves to transition to electric cars and vehicles, Africa, your excellencies, stands to be able to attract billions of dollars in private investment for greening global transport systems. That's because Africa has 80% of the global deposits of platinum, 50% of the global deposit of cobalt, 40% of nickel, and substantial deposits of lithium. Africa must not make the same mistakes of the past. Africa must set itself up to manufacture lithium-ion batteries to tap into the future markets of electric vehicles that some projections estimate will run into several trillions of dollars in future. I must say here, 
by the cost of establishing a lithium iron precursor factory in Africa is three times less expensive than in China and three times less expensive than in the United States. The future before us is full of challenges on climate change, no doubt. But it also has and holds massive opportunities on green growth for our economies. To mobilize a lot more private financing for climate change and green growth, governments and development partners should take five approaches. First, establish national development plans for green transition for their economies. Second, subsidize green industries to spur growth, raise demand, profitability, and sustainability. Third, multilateral and bilateral financial institutions should provide guarantees at scale to help de risk investments by the private sector. Fourth, support should be provided for the preparation and development of bankable projects that can provide high risk adjusted returns to the private sector. And fifth, existing public finance infrastructure should be transferred to the private sector. What we are collectively calling Working with Africa 50 asset recycling to mobilize more private sector resources for greener infrastructure. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, over the next three days of these annual meetings, we will discuss and explore these and other big ideas as we move to climate-proof Africa and boost green growth. The future of Africa is green. Our sun, wind, geothermal, and water should power our continent. Our infrastructure should be green and greener. Our economies must be climate-proofed and resilient. Let's unleash the power of the private sector for a greener Africa. Welcome once again. Thank you very much. Shukran. Right. Uh, so, so very much to pick from that. I mean, the African Development Bank annual uh, meeting in Sharm El Sheikh, and you know, talked about infrastructure for the African continent, infrastructure financing vis-a-vis -vis the challenges of climate change, vis-a-vis -vis the challenges of development, and harmonisation of efforts. And it's a richly attended event. You know, great African leaders. The Embassy Menegagwa was there. President of Egypt, uh, uh, Al Sisi, was there. I missed all of this. And this is at a time where he talked about the rebounding of the African continent. You know, seven countries that were inundated with COVID, that growth was tepid in the last year, are now going back to the growth scale. So a lot has been able to encapsulate in that speech. Yes. And we'll see more proceedings from them. I, I, you want to have a stab at this? Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversations that we had at this annual meeting. The focus this year, as he emphasized, as the president of the African Development Bank, our very own <laughs> Dr. Akim Umiadishino, who talked about the fact that we would be, uh, the, the future of Africa is green, and the focus of this particular annual meeting is um, private sector uh, led, mobilizing private sector financing for, uh, for climate change and green growth in Africa. The United Nations had said that developing countries, of which many of them are situated in Africa, have challenges in tackling climate change in terms of financing and technology required to do so. The truth is that when we talk about climate change, compared to other parts of the Western world where there's a lot of um, you know, pollution, Africa is still lagging behind in terms of emission, you know, green, greenhouse gas emission. However, there's still that conversation that it would, you know, there's an adverse effect and we must begin to act now. Again, like I mentioned, it is looking at the private sector and how they can finance um, the climate change agenda. Dr. Basu. Okay, Sharm El Sheikh, that was uh, the same uh, place in Egypt where COP27 was held in November 2022. So what the African Development Bank has done in holding its 58th uh, annual assembly and the uh, 48th uh, meeting of the African Development uh, Fund is to go on the back of that, you know, uh, COP27, uh, coming after COP26, 
uh, the climate change conference that took place in uh, Glasgow uh, in Scotland. And now you saw that uh, President Akimomi Adeshino was making reference to COP28 when he acknowledged the chairman designate of that uh, issue, uh, Al Jaba of uh, Egypt. Now, what is important here is that the focus on climate change is something that needs to be stressed. And one of the fallouts from uh, uh, Dr. Additional's commentary is that public sector financing alone cannot do it, that you need private sector financing. And this was one of the things you know, uh, that came up in, uh, in Glasgow at uh, COP26. But the big problem here is that all the promises made by the Western countries, including financial institutions that formed in Glasgow a coalition for, for climate change adaptation issues, many of them have not been able to meet that expectation. Just rhetoric, not much has been done. The irony here is that Africa accounts for 3% of uh, climate change uh, crisis in the world. In 2015, we were told, in uh, 2005, we were told during the uh, Paris Climate Change uh, Agreement that the target, a target of 1.5 uh, Celsius degrees has been set for the rest of the world, if the world will not enter into catastrophe. Only recently, the World Meteorological Organization was saying that in fact, in five years time, by uh, uh, 2027, 2028, uh, that in fact we will have exceeded that 1.5 degrees Celsius. So the countries that are most guilty in this regard, they are not doing enough. So we have to move beyond rhetoric. That is why I think it's important that the African Development Bank is focusing on this issue and saying that, look, the private sector in Africa also has a role to play in terms of what Africa needs. It's in the SX of trillions. So I think the focus is important. It's called issues-based approach, multi-stakeholder approach to diplomacy under the, the framework of new and modern diplomacy. How do you promote transparency, accountability? How do you ensure that you focus on issues and some of the emergent issues in the world, you know, climate change, adaptation, is top of it. But we don't have that enough commitment where we get a lot of rhetoric. And it's good that uh, uh, President Akiumi Additional of the AFDP is drawing our attention to the real issues, the basic issues. Absolutely.